Professor Ashok Mishra is currently a distinguished professor at NASI, National Academy of Sciences, India, at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Earlier, he was director IIT Bombay and chairman India Intellectual Ventures from 2008 to 2016 at IIT Delhi, from 1977 to 2000, and at Montano Chemical Chem Company, he obtained his B.Tech from IIT Kanpur in 1968, M.S. from Tufts University 1969, and Ph.D. from the University of Massachusetts 1974. Professor Mishra is a director on the boards of Jubilant Life Sciences Limited, Jubilant Pharma Limited, Kirloskirk Electric Company Limited, and Higher Education Financing Agency. Earlier, he has been on the boards of Reliance Industries Limited, National Thermal Power Corporation, and Rashtriya Chemical, Chemicals and Fertilizers Limited. He has held several responsibilities with Ministry of Human Resource Development, Government of India, including Chairman of the Standing Committee of the IIT Council and Chairman Boards of Governors of IIT Roorkee. He has received several awards, including Distinguished Service Award, Polymer Processing Society USA, Distinguished Service Award IIT Delhi, Distinguished Alumnus Award from all his alma maters, Indian Chemical Council Lifetime Achievement Award for Education and Research, National Systems Gold Medal, Chemtech CEW Awards Education and Acharya Prafil Chandra Ray Memorial Award for Indian Chemical Society. He has guided 22 doctoral students, who authored a book, has eight patents plus seven in the process, and over 182 international publication. So this introduction is quite brief. I have tried to include all the points, but yes, a lot of a lot other things goes to his credit. So with this introduction, with this, uh, my humble suggest, my humble request, please, sir, uh, you can continue with your. Uh, with your talk with and enlighten us with your wisdom. All right. So a very good morning to all of you. Um, the participants of this faculty development program under the AICT training and learning, what we call ATAL, very nicely worded, initiative. Uh, this is an excellent initiative and I feel honored to be invited by UPES to um, uh, share some of my thoughts uh, University of Energy and Petroleum is a very good friend of mine, uh, uh, and I do go there often. I'm on the research council and so on, which you did not mention, but that's the important thing for UPS. <laughs> but that's good. Okay. Uh, let me begin by saying um, that higher education is extremely important for the growth of any country. It goes without saying that if you look at all the countries around the globe, uh, it's higher education institutions, and of course, uh, secondary education goes along with it. Uh, if they are not good, those countries are not considered that advanced and so on. So it's the education system which has to uh, be nurtured in our country um, to the extent possible. I consider institutions of higher education like the IITs, NITs, UPS, universities, you know, Dehradun has so many universities now. <clears throat> they are really temples of learning. And we should, we should consider them that and give them the best support that we can. Um, the responsibility for this lies with the dedicated teachers who are the really the faculty, who are really the backbone of any institution and industry. People might think it's the vice chancellor and it's the uh, board of governors and so on who are controlling and you know try to weave them up but if the faculty is not good if the faculty is not doing their job right then that institution will not grow and we have to therefore nurture the faculty which are actually the uh, uh, heroes in the system of education any any institution and you go look around uh, anywhere in the world it doesn't matter is as good as its faculty, since uh, uh, they are the ones who make the difference. And it is imperative for education institutions to attract the best brains for higher education institutions, and then nurture them 
and retain them and so on. The teachers have become the role models when you get good teachers for the young students that they should emulate. The, <coughs> for this, it's imperative that they develop skills which make them quality teachers and the pride of that institution in which they are, and in fact, the nation in the larger context. So therefore, I fully endorse this initiative of AICT for promoting programs of this kind. Uh, let me address a few issues for development of life skills in the faculty. Um, I have not given a similar talk earlier, of course, in, in the passing as I've said, but uh, uh, I think it's an important thing that people should uh, you know, learn these life skills to take things forward. So I will just give my thoughts. Uh, lots of I, um, uh, Professor Jitain Pandey was very kind to invite me and he sent a whole bunch of uh, uh, things that should be covered. And I'm sure other people are covering a whole a lot of things. So I will not cover all of it. I'll cover what I think is important and within half an hour, 40 minutes that uh, we, I can share. So the first thing I start with is vision and goals. The very first thing I like to stress for everyone is that it is on vision. Everyone should develop their own personal vision. Life. teaching in a class you should have a vision that I have a class okay uh, if you are doing research your aspiration that the research and they will be impaired then you have to Uh, I think Professor Mishra is facing some internet uh, connectivity challenge at his end. So we'll take a couple of minutes to reconnect with him. Can you hear me now? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. It's okay. It's, it's I, I, yeah, I have two internet connections, so it jumped from one to the other, unfortunately. Sorry about that. That's, uh, but I had to uh, take care of it. So, uh, so you have to have uh, teaching aspirations, um, uh, uh, vision for research aspirations. Where do you want to go? Not that you're just there, you know, you've got one project, there's that. What do you want to make a difference in life? vision on how you wish to contribute to the institute and actually to the to the state that you are in and to the country and so on in some cases it's important to align your vision with that of the institute but uh, that just gives you a guideline but if you don't have your personal vision then you are just going and the work becomes like a routine alongside you have to set your goals that look for this vision things that i have said three four things what is my goals? What will I do in the short term, in the next two, three, five years, and was it next longer term of 10 years? Where do I want to be if I want to be a great teacher, a great researcher, and so on? And then you have to do the roadmap. So what do I need to do this year, next year, and so on and so forth? Only then you will be able to achieve your vision and your goals. <clears throat> and this, for this, you also need to develop a strategy and planning. Uh, you have to develop a strategy for yourself, for yourself to follow your vision. How will you follow your vision? Is it is your vision reasonable? If it's not reasonable, you should revise your vision. But then you develop a <clears throat> strategy and plan to so that you do this uh, for yourself. This basically means how you will go about achieving what you want to achieve in life as well as in your workplace. Once the strategy is in place, then you of course say, okay, in the short term, I'll do this and this and that, that and strategy for also for short term and long term. This, once you do these two things, vision and strategy, 
it will immensely help you in achieving your work life balance without this you're a little bit lost you're here and there you don't know whether you're coming or going and so on so you have to do this <clears throat> then um, uh, i'll go a little bit of what uh, uh, was uh, guidelines were given uh, is that leadership skills See, every faculty member you may not be a dean you may not be a head but when you are in a classroom you are a leader you are leader of your subject you are leader of the class that you are teaching the teachers that you are teaching if you don't consider that please uh, start uh, thinking of you as a leader because pe people in the class are looking as you as a leader you know as a faculty as when you are teaching and you are leader in your subject and and how you are transmitting it once in the classroom you have to provide that leadership while you are transmitting that knowledge you have to do it with a solid uh, background and say yes i am the boss in this and do it in the classroom situation you are the leader and you have to lead from the front of course some people are now going into google and all that business the web mail and and they get some information here and there but you have to be ahead of all the students in the class in the knowledge and provide that education leadership whether it's a class of 20 students or 100 students it doesn't matter you are the leader in your research group you have two research students 20 research students doesn't matter but in that research group you are the leader complete command of the subject is absolutely necessary for becoming a leader if you <coughs> don't have it you have to develop it you're always the other thing about a teacher especially for a teacher a leader teacher i will call it is that you should never think that i know everything actually you know only a little bit okay and there is lot to learn and you can learn from your peers you can learn from books you can learn from even your students sometimes will uh, will uh, give you enough ideas that you can learn so never be afraid to learn and only then you will be a great teacher great leader i would say in the teaching profession this can be done by keeping up with the literature and also whatever you're teaching how applicable whether it's chemical engineering or whether it's computer science or whether it's economics what you are teaching how relevant is that to everyday life that you're seeing you're reading the newspapers and so on uh, even in economics and politics and so on so you have to see what you're teaching what uh, the students are learning how relevant it is to the world around you and innovation is a very important aspect always look in look at the ways and means of improving your teaching material and the way that you are teaching already we have seen so many transformations take place taking place going from the so called uh, teaching with the blackboard chalk and talk it went to overhead slides now uh, then it went to uh, uh, slides that you know 35 mm slides then it went to powerpoint it's all on the computer now and the moment you change one method to the other you have to learn how to do it as better than anybody else okay you should be the best you should that's what your vision is that i want to be the best teacher just remember that they the students derive aspiration inspiration from you and your actions if you are sloppy in the class the students will be sloppy in their work if you are smart, i mean if we teach you uh, uh, the things uh, in a uh, nice smart manner i'm not saying smart in the sense of sense of going with a tie and a jacket and all that but if you teach it with your solid uh, background the students will love you the students will respect you uh, that is the leadership mutual trust is another uh, important aspect of leadership uh, in any level if you respect your students they will respect you if you respect your dean and director by chatra they will respect you so mutual respect especially comes the higher up you are the more mutual respect you have to show only then your juniors will will uh, uh, see you as a leader otherwise they see you as a leader in name but not in action what i'm trying to say is that you have to be leader in action not in name only and there are many examples i don't want to go well into that and then you talk about excellence <clears throat> excellence in life this is a very uh, important one that all the faculty because i i'm presuming there are mostly faculty members attending 
Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. So all the faculty members have to have a will to excel. You should not take it. Remember, I said good, good education institutions will take your country forward. And what does that depend upon? It depends upon you, the teachers, the faculty. So you have to do whatever you do to the best of your ability. And that's where excellence comes. You have to have the will to excel. When you go to a classroom, it's not that, oh, man, I went and finished my course, I'm done. No, you have to say, okay, today's lecture was better than yesterday's lecture. And I really feel good that I have transmitted something new, new knowledge to the students. So your will to excel and take it to the next level is important since there is no substitute, absolutely zero substitute for excellence. So you have to do that. Your teaching should be at the highest level. Your research should be uh, with the same will to excel at the highest level uh, with, of course, limitation of what you have for research equipment and so on. Do share your actions towards excellent with people that you interact with. So if you have some ideas of taking things forward in a better manner, please share it with your uh, uh, faculty, your colleagues, your staff even. You know, the staff sometimes are not doing good work. If the, even the lower staff, cleaning staff, they should do the cleaning or whatever they're doing to the best of their ability, the deep people who are in the office. And you have to encourage them. Say, look, I want you to be the best Sano that I have or the best typist that I have and so on. So instill this uh, 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 excellence in all the all your colleagues and so on. Always ask yourself, whatever activity I'm doing, you're doing this uh, uh, faculty development program. So you should ask yourself, have I made the best program that's possible? Well, you tried your best, but can it be better? Learn this at the end of it, not just that it's completed and you've submitted a report. If you have to do it again, or if somebody else has to do it, you have to say, okay, it was very good, but it was not excellent. How will I take it to excellent? Or it was excellent, can I make it better? That's also all right. So, and if yes, that if you are saying that I am doing very good, uh, then you have to see how you can improve and follow the path of excellence. If no, then you would need to do what you need to do to achieve excellence. Uh, it's it's a, It should be no shame or no uh, uh, difficulty in sharing with your a senior colleague and say, look, I'm doing this. Am I doing it, it right? Am I not doing it right? And, and improve upon it as you go along. Identify your strengths. It's very important because it's the strengths will take you forward. These are your true assets. And you identify them that I do this, this, this very well. Build on the strength and that will take you towards this path of excellence. And also identify your weaknesses. If you're weak in some, sub, some area of teaching, improve upon it so that you uh, uh, take it also to the path of excellence. All right, so now the, with, with this background of vision and strategy and leadership and excellence, now I'll go a little bit towards the work-life balance. It's very important to develop a work-life balance. Everybody has the same chores, get up in the morning, get ready, go to work, eight hours, six hours, 12 hours, whatever your work time is, come back and again, the same grind. The kids are at home, family is at home and so on. So you have to do that balance. And again, go back to your vision. Say, look, I will spend nine hours or eight hours at my work and give it the best that I can. And all that excellence and all that comes in the picture, in the, in the middle. And then say then, now this is my free time. Free time from work, not free time. There's no free time till you're sleeping. Uh, spend a, so you should spend adequate times with your families and friends. Immediate family is the most important. You can't neglect. Friends are very important because they, they good friends will tell you your weaknesses also and, and you should share with them. Just having a social gathering is not, it's very nice to do that, but you don't learn from it. So you have to work with friends. You have to develop hobbies and practice them. You're singing, stamp collecting, painting, whatever it is, some hobby one should develop for this work-life balance. Because otherwise it's all becomes engineering, engineering, science, science, and all that. And of course, I take 
I very much enjoy playing sports. I play tennis and squash myself. Even now I'm playing squash. With the pandemic, I can't go enough. That's the only problem. And this keeps you physically healthy. It gets your sweat out. It gets your toxins out. It makes your uh, mind also a little bit uh, sharper. All your aggression is out. So they provide both hobbies and sports, whatever it is, either both or one of the two, uh, provide a diversion from work, family, so on and so forth. To me, that is the best meditation you can do. The best meditation I, I feel is when I'm playing squash and I'm just so concentrated on that, hitting the ball right or tennis and hitting the ball right. That concentration is absolutely uh, essential for all the other things that you do. So that work-life balance you have to maintain as I see it. Of course, you can ask me questions uh, as we go along. Uh, then stress management. <laughs> if, you, if you keep a good work-life balance, there is no place for stress. Why should you be stressed for anything? Having said this, there are times you do feel stressed because something didn't happen the way you wanted it. And the best thing is to, uh, to divert your mind and engage in the hobby or sport that you like. And this will tend to relieve your stress uh, many times. Of course, a lot of people do meditation. Meditation is a great way to relieve stress, but it has to be done in a proper manner and a proper teacher should have taught you meditation. And I see that some of the programs in, the, in your four day, five day is on meditation. So if, if that is the one which you want to pursue, learn it properly, okay, and then do it there's no point, and I'm just saying that close your eyes and thinking of thousand other things. That's not meditation. You have to actually just clear your mind and you can learn, learn that from a good teacher. Practice of yoga, also, it's a, I call that a sport, is also a very good uh, way for stress management if that is what you want to do. The other thing is that along with stress, uh, sometimes stresses are caused because of change. Some people accept change very easily and some people don't accept change very easily. So you have to learn to sometimes, depending on the situation, be actually an agent of change. Or if changes are taking place in, the, in your institution, because you know people are, the way I learned and the way people are taught now are different. So you have to adapt to that change. So you have to accept the change and, and and look at change management as a way of life. How do you management? How do you adapt to change management? How can you be a leader of change management? Don't be stuck in what you have done for several years in the past. Necessarily stress will build up if you don't change at times. I have been to some universities and there's many times I say, why don't you do it like this? Or institutes, they say, no, no, for 30 years, we have done it like this. Are, that doesn't mean you should continue to do it like that, no? Life has changed, world has changed. And um, the other thing, sometimes I go to institutions and they say, uh, I'm not saying for yours, maybe none of them uh, apply, none of, the, none of it applies to you. They say, oh, if you do this thing any differently, you won't get anywhere. Are, who's asking you to get anywhere? It's your own vision, right? You have to define your vision if you want to teach better, if you want to do your research better, you have to do new things. Not that somebody is watching. Who is watching? You are watching yourself the most. Nobody can watch you more better than your own, own self. So the self, self-motivation, self, again, going back to vision is the most important. Once you have your vision and strategy right, then all things will uh, fall in place. Look at the world around you. It is changing all the times. And therefore, you have to do your work-life balance with the change that is taking place. Also important is critical thinking and decision-making. Imagination, imagination and independent will, independent thinking are important for this. So without imagination, without imagination, you will not think of any change. Without imagination, you won't go anywhere. Every time you are doing something, think out of the box to, to see how I can change the system around me towards excellence. They all will match up your vision, strategy, excellence, all that. And you can be the leader for that. And you will see in your own 
own institution, those who have actually spent time to bring about the change and being bold, they may be criticized sometimes, but they are the ones who will emerge as the leaders. They are the ones who become deans and directors and, and vice chancellors and so on. Also, you have to think win-win uh, at all the times. Any interactions you have with each other, <clears throat> think what is it best for the situation for myself and for the other party. In a classroom, for example, I'll take a very simple example. Think win-win with the students. You have to gain, you will gain because you are a good teacher and students appreciate you. And the students will gain because you have kept up with your uh, uh, update with your literature and so on. And you're teaching more relevant subjects as we go along. You have adapted to the change. And therefore, both have to win. If you teach not very well, both have to lose. You can have a lose-lose situation also. But you should try to aspire for a win-win situation. In research, both you and your research students gain because research students get a PhD and a paper and things like that and of course new ideas and together you are bringing up something new, something which is publishable, something which is uh, not done before and so on. In all this, it is also important that is, it is important to be, to understand first, if you're talking to somebody in the classroom or in the research or wherever in administration, many times people start talking, okay? But before you do that, <clears throat> you, have to, you have to listen, you have to be, you have to understand what the situation before you want yourself to be understood. Uh, people sometimes take this, make the mistake of, okay, my view is I don't want to listen to you. No, you have to listen to, be a good listener and then make your viewpoint clear. Another uh, important as, aspect in life is negotiations. Negotiations are very, very important. In everyday life, you are negotiating. In any argument, there are, I'm saying nego argument, but in any situation, there are two points of view. When, supposing your class students want a day off and you don't want to give it. You want to have a quiz and they don't want a quiz. You are negotiating with them. Okay, I'll do it tomorrow. Let's see which is. So you have to negotiate. You're talking to your boss about some course you want to teach, some course you don't want to teach. You're negotiating. At home, you, people don't even think of this, but with your children, those of you who have children, every time that you talk to a child, child wants this, 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 this you are negotiating, then he, 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 I won't get you this, I won't, this is bad for you, this is good for you. Just think, you know, the child also wants something, which is the best in best interest of the person and you. And and of course, those of, you know, I, those who are married, the biggest negotiations you have is with your spouse. Okay, all the time, every day, you know, you don't realize this, you call it, okay, I'm fighting, I'm not fighting, this that. No, no, it's not fighting, it is just negotiations. And if you do the proper negotiations, you both come out towards a win-win situation. So in a work-life balance, to keep your calm, you have to listen better uh, before you start speaking about your own ideas and come to a point where uh, something works out which is uh, to the best of every, every individual, the two people, you know, I was a director and I had to negotiate a huge amount with the worker unions and so on. But then we saw, okay, what they wanted, what they were their grievances, what we could do, what limitations we had as a director, and then uh, come to a final solution. So you, to, so you have to develop the art of negotiation. Then you will see automatically the stress levels and all that I talked about earlier will be much less. If you just only see your point of view stress levels definitely go up, all right? And then the last thing is uh, understanding universal human values and ethics. So human values, people have many, many different... Uh... Hello? Okay. Uh, hello? Yes, sir. So we can hear you. Okay, there was a disturbance, so I stopped. So define your values 
just like you defined your vision, vision is right, but you have to define your values and follow them as, a be, as best as you can. It's not that I have a vision and I'll do all wrong things to, uh, to achieve my vision. No, you have to define the self, for this self-awareness is critical for developing, developing your values. So, I mean, simple values like honesty. In all your lives, you must have seen that who is the person you appreciate and respect the most? Who's the one who's honest? So therefore, you know it, that, you, that this is uh, the value that you appreciate in others, so therefore you should instill in us. Truthfulness. Whether you lose or gain, it doesn't matter. But in order to gain something, if you uh, give a false statement, then it, your conscience will hurt you, stress levels will go up, and so on and so forth. So you have to be uh, truthful. Okay. Uh, interact with your peers in a in a parallel level, in an equal level, and so on. Everybody has their own egos and all that. So just remember, your ego should not overtake their ego. Your ego should actually come below it and and go for that negotiation and un understand these human values in a proper manner. And the last thing in this is ethical in all actions. So ethics is, of course, we talked about uh, honesty and all that, but ethics here is that we, sometimes people are doing unethical research practices. They have scientific misconduct. Uh, they uh, publish false results to get ahead because they'll get a paper. Go to a journal where the paper will be accepted with false results and so on. You shouldn't do all that. You should do what is ethical. Many times, even in boards and all that, sometimes ethics issues come in uh, uh, and you have to make sure that whatever at the highest level you do is ethical and proper. So these are the human values you should uh, instill yourself. So I will, I will just uh, go over it once more very quickly. Uh, that vision and goals you have to set uh, only then you can go forward. For that, you have to have a strategy in planning. And in order to do that, you have to, alongside, develop some leadership skills. You have to define excellence in life, whatever you think is excellent, and then take it forward. With all this, then you come to a work-life balance, which is makes you happy and, and, uh, and you can manage life. Uh, stress, if you uh, if you do things right, stress will be very little, but stress management is also important by diverting yourself to some other things. Critical thinking and decision making is imperative. You should do that. And then uh, your own human values you define and ethics and take things forward. So I think with the with this, I would like to end. And if there are any questions, I would like to... Uh, that's why I asked for that extra time because I knew... My talk will go at least half an hour, then there's no time for any interaction. I'd be delighted to interact with everybody. Yes, sir. I think we have received a couple of questions, and uh, both the questions, they all, the, both of them, uh, they are talking about, they are asking about work life balance. Like in what this is? present situation, work life balance, how to strike the, you know, uh, work life balance amidst this situation we are facing, we all of us are uh, facing and we are dealing with on a daily basis. So how we can actually go for, you know, strike this work-life balance? Does it actually exist? Or we are just, you know, uh, trying to balance, but again, you know, coming up with the same imbalances. So this is what <coughs> I think the yeah, participant wants. You have to balance because as I told you, change is always taking place now. Unfortunately, this change that took place, the pandemic and all that was for the overall for the worse because people are getting sick, people are losing their lives and so on. Uh, but it has affected the rest of us who have to work from home, take care that we don't uh, 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 get COVID-19, we don't become the transmitters of COVID-19 and so on. Uh, uh, I, I see this as a transient change. Uh, if you look at the long term, of your life, 70, 80 years, whatever you live, 90 years. This will be a passing phase of one year, one and a half years. If you look at the larger uh, century, it'll be you know, very little. 
1918, there was a, a Spanish flu, and uh, many, many more lives, 50 million lives or something were lost. And until this came, nobody even talked about it. It was to talk about World War I, World War II, this, that, but nobody talked about the pandemic till the next pandemic came. So it becomes a blip. Uh, and if you look at the millennium, the history of the earth, it will be like an absolute small blip. Um, but having said that, uh, it has raised a lot of uh, new innovations. Uh, and I, as I call it, change management. Uh, for all these people to come to Dehradun may have been difficult. But now so many have just joined through, uh, through webinar mode. I may not have been able to come on that particular given date, but given that on one date, I have to do one hour, I don't have to go to the airport. Needless to say, saving fuel and time going and traveling for a one hour lecture, we spent a day. So some things are, are getting better. Some things will be here to stay uh, because we have learned a lot of new things. And so this is part of life, it's going on. Hopefully, hopefully the the pandemic will go away, so at least we don't live in fear right now. That is the only bad part that I see. We are living in fear. Otherwise, things are going on. Rightly said. So, so every situation comes with their, with its own pros and cons. So it's all yes. up to us. What what do we pick up? We want to Positive up, yes. things. Yes, yes. Sir. And we are getting a lot of compliments for you, sir, that you had a very... We had a very uh, wonderful time spent with you, 40 minutes. And uh, we, in fact, these... This time is quite less to get the understanding what the vision you carry with you and your experience that you are that you are sharing with us and, and we are all are looking forward to have a detailed session with you one day a kind of a workshop and uh, thank you so much sir for, for your time for your energy that you have given us today uh, right. with this yes sir is there any uh, other questions uh, I, you gave me till 8 45 so that three four minutes but yes, it's sir. not then it's all right i'm i'm quite Quite happy. In fact, the people are only, you know, they are complimenting you. They are thanking you. Thank you so much for this enlightening session. We are getting a lot of comments for for you, sir. And uh, with, uh, Dr. J.K. Pandey, I'd like to invite you for your comments, for your closing comments, sir. Thank you so much for the nice words, yes, of all the participants. <laughs> Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Yes. Okay. We have simplified the things. Yes, we are getting such comments. We have simplified the all the uh, the points that we are going to cover in this FTP in a nutshell. And yes, we we have noted down your points. This recording session is also with us, and we will share with all the participants. Okay. Yes. Thanks a lot, sir. So I have this in a written form, so if you do want, I can share it with you. Sure, sir. Sir, we, we will require this. We need to okay. prepare a report every day. So we, we sh if it's it's good for us if you can share. Sir. Okay, sure. Thanks. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Shall I log off? You can log off, sir. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye, Thank sir. You. Bye. 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 So moving ahead, we have Another very interesting session and enlightening session and very a uh, brilliant personality with us today, Magyan Subira. And uh, to introduce her to uh, know more about her, I would like to call Dr. Shalini Vora, my colleague. She's assist, Associate Professor, Department of Humanities, School of Life. And uh, I hand over uh, this virtual mic to Dr. Shalini Vora now. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Dr. Pooja. So very so much, Dr. Pooja. So very so good. Very, so much, very good morning to all of you. So hope you all are enjoying the blissful journey of life. We all are blessed that we got the opportunity to be a part of such a beautiful way of living when whole world is in deep crisis. Because everyone will not be able to choose and adapt blissful journey. ऐसा कहा भी जाता है कि वो विरले विरलों में कुछ ही होते हैं जिनको कृपा गुरु की मिलती है और आशीर्वाद बुजुर्गों का और होता है और मेहर ईश्वर की 
So with these words, please join me in welcoming loving Ma Gyan Suvira. Ma Gyan Suvira is a mystic teacher, healer, a life coach, and a mentor. Ma Gyan Suvira comes from a blessed Atharvan Vedic lineage. She is the founder of Cosmic Intelligence Plus Meditation Techniques and the Cosmic Intelligence Evolutionary Path. She lives in of Holy Ganga on the outskirts of her life. She is extensively engaged in facilitating workshops and training programs through India and abroad. Having mastered various applied versions of healing streams and benefit people energy in her core pursuit, she offers to teach more than 51 modalities from different cultures of the world. Her workshops are soaked in Vedantic wisdom. She speaks on yog yogic psychology, Indian philosophy, healing, wellness, and meditation. Her retreats are personalized for spiritual growth and complete blossoming. And I myself experienced such a blissful experience under her guidance. When she taught me beautiful way of living cosmic intelligence techniques. So not taking much time, I request Ma Suvira to tell us the tips of stress management skills so that we can implement work-life balance. Ma, over to you, Ma. Thank you, Shalini, and a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, such a beautiful gathering here. Uh, I'm really very appreciative, and it's an honor to be on this panel. Um, I've known Shalini for quite some time, and I've known the university uh, and the people there. I see Mrs. Ayer also here. It's a big warm welcome to everyone. So I've been asked to speak about uh, work, life, balance, and uh, management of stress. So, you know, these three words are three big books uh, by itself. Work itself is a big, thick book. Life itself is a big, thick book to talk about, and stress is another. So putting these together, um, little by little, I would love to talk about all the three individually, and then how do we blend? You see, work um, and life, these two things are something, these two vehicles are something all of you are riding. Each one of us is uh, riding a, a, a separate vehicle of work and a separate vehicle of their personal life, their own life. So uh, if, if, if anyone is riding two vehicles separately, then it has to give stress. It has to lead to stress. Can there be work and life together it is a very interesting topic in itself. Can we have work and life together? For this, you need to first understand, uh, you know, life and the principles of life. A very beautiful uh, talk I've been hearing for about half an hour. Uh, Mishnaji is talking about ethics and values and a very beautiful conversation. So one needs to understand something about life first. Um, if we are able to understand what is our life meant for, what are we supposed to do in our life? then the balance of work and life happens very easily. It's only when we don't understand something about our life and when we don't know truly who we are, what are we here for, what is our purpose, why are we born, why am I so different from the other person, why is he so different from the other. You know, this whole complication comes from the very basic fundamental fact that we don't know ourselves. And if you know ourselves, if you, if you know yourself, then there is nothing like competition, there is nothing like um, uh, you know, stress and, 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 the, and the whole load and burden of carrying your work on your shoulders and feeding and fending. If you understand yourself, then all of these things dissolve because the understanding mm -hmm. of your own self is the fundamental reason for why you're here. You need to understand yourself. And uh, also to be very appreciative of the fact that each one of us is so exclusive. It's so, it's so different from the other. We, none of us are 
Uh, we don't have any kind of replicas anywhere. We don't have somebody, I don't have any someone like me anywhere in the world. And that, that fact itself, when I understand, truly understand it deep within me, I understand that since there isn't anybody like me at, anywhere else in the, uh, on earth, I don't have to be some, like someone. I can be just me the way I am. And uh, once, you, once you come in that deep acceptance, there's no competition and there is no comparison and there is no uh, dragging yourself to do something that you're not truly, uh, you know, born for. It's like, you know, let's say there is, a, there is a lotus bud coming out from a pond. There's a, there's a, there's a mucky pond. Uh, all of you know that lotuses are born in, in muck and in slush. So let's say there is a lotus bud emerging from this pond and the bud is opening up and uh, it has for the first time seen the world and it's looking at uh, you know the garden all around. It's looking at the roses and the beautiful jasmine and the lovely alamandas and the lovely crotons and so many such a beautiful foliage and flowers around. And it is wondering what, what should I be like, you know? looks at the rose and sees, I wish I had this smell. I wish this aroma and this beautiful fragrance came out from me. It looks at the jasmine and sees such a tiny flower. Look how aromatic it is. I want to be like a jasmine. And then it looks at, uh, at another beautiful dahlia and it says, what beautiful petals. My God, what stunning colors. I want to be like this. So as long as the, as long as the lotus bud is looking all around the garden and appreciating and wanting to be this and wanting to be that and this and that, you know, it gets involved, it remains involved in uh, a very sensual and a very sense-oriented living. For once, it needs to reflect on itself. What am I? Who am I? And the moment she understands that I'm a lotus bud and I have no freedom to be anything else other than the lotus, and I am a beautiful lotus bud, and I can be a beautiful lotus tomorrow, and the only focus and concentration or the only attention that I should be paying to is to my own blossoming and to all my petals coming out slowly, beautifully, allowing the sunshine to soak in completely. A staying power in the muck that she's born. A staying power, you know, it's so, so important. Each one of us doesn't want to be where, where we are. We want to be somewhere else, you know, and can you, can you just accept where you are and focus on the, on the entire process of blossoming, blooming, to allow the sunshine to get in, etc. So once the lotus realizes that she has no other freedom to be anything else other than the lotus, how much ever she wants to be a jasmine or a rose or a elementa, she can't. And, the, with, and, and it's a happy acceptance. It's not a sad acceptance. It's a happy acceptance because there is beauty within herself that she has to realize. There's beauty, there's, there's so much of strength, there's so much of uh, uh, awesomeness inside her that she has to realize. Once she realizes this, then the blooming is, uh, you know, the unfolding of all the petals is a beautiful process. And this is what life is about. We need to understand that we are a part of nature. Each one of us has been you know, brought on this earth with something spectacular for sure. An ant is as spectacular as an elephant. You know, uh, a small microbe is as spectacular as something which is so tangible and visible. We are a part of nature. Nature has concocted all the things that we have and we need to come into deep reverence and acceptance of who we are. This is the essential and the core principle of enjoying life, you know, that I enjoy all the things that God has given me. And uh, I completely uh, deny and don't put my attention into what God has not given me, simple. Whatever I have, I need to be fully aware, fully reverentially aware. Then it unfolds into something very beautiful because our attention is outside. All the time our attention is outside in this one and that one and this one and that one. That's why the unfolding process doesn't happen. We don't unfold as a bud into a flower. You know, this is the core problem. And this is what needs to be understood by everyone. There's something spectacular, something beautiful, and uh, many beautiful things inside each one of us. If you can put your focus on to understanding what are my strengths and how can I make these strengths worthy 
how can how can I make my life worthy with these trends? Then things will change. Your your whole dynamics and the whole thing that goes on in your brain, the wiring in your brain will change. When your focus goes inward. Also, there is something fundamental each one of us must know about ourselves. And the and the you know this this wisdom and this knowledge of knowing ourselves is not a one-day wisdom knowledge. It's a lifelong study. Oh, who am I? Oh, who am I? And what am I doing here? What are the things that are there about me that I must know? What is my psychology, my inner anatomy, and my inner subtler anatomy? Something that we all must put our attention into to know ourselves completely. So when I say, you know, who am I? And, and, and my focus on what, what is this person that I am is not limited just to understanding about what kind of a bud I am or flower I am. It goes beyond that to understanding the, you know, the, the various layers and layers and layers of personality that I am. And then underneath of all this persona lies this beautiful God-like soul, soul which is God-like and God which is soul-like. Yeah, this where there's this brilliant essence of who we truly are. Once you get in touch, with all of these layers within yourself, you will understand life externally and internally. Work is just a small fragment, just a small fraction of this vast understanding of life itself. And work is very pleasantly uh, you know, carried on with when you understand the larger picture of you and who you are. Yeah? Work is something that requires your presence. It requires your presence 100%. It's like, that's why we have these stories of dharma in our philosophy. We have so many stories of dharma, you know. Your dharma as a, as, a, as a person, as a role that you have taken in your office. Your dharma as a wife or a husband. Your dharma as a child. Your dharma as a brother, sister. We have so many roles that we undertake. And there are dharmic values that we need to live on, you know, once we talk about um, this, this word dharma. So there is a word dharma as well. You know, when you are at work, whatever work you undertake, first and foremost thing, what work you undertake should be completely in line with what understanding you have reached about yourself. You know, whatever assessment and whatever understanding you've learned about yourself, your work should be 100% in line with it. It shouldn't be something diametrically opposite or a, a tangent which is going uh, absolutely in a different direction. No, it has to be in alignment with who you truly are. For instance, I cannot expect a lotus bird, uh, a, a lotus bud or a flower to smell like lime or orange. You know, I can't expect an orange to have the colors of a pomegranate. So it 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 has to be in 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 alignment with your core nature, whatever work you undertake. So there should be a lot of thinking that goes into what kind of work should I be doing, and the the basis of what you choose to take as work should not be on what earnings you would have. It shouldn't be based on what earnings you would have. Earnings will happen, they will come. When you come in alignment with life and work together, according to your own true nature, earnings will come to you. They will come to you because you're exquisite. There isn't anyone like you. There's no competition there. You know, when you come in your true alignment, there is no competition. You're exquisite, you're exclusive, and money will come any which way, it will come. So you need to find your alignment. You need to understand what is truly that what you love to work as. And then when you take it up, your hundred percent presence, you know, the power of now. That means that when you're at work, you're at work and you follow all the, the beautiful things that are expected out of that work. You follow everything. You're hundred percent there. You're not 50% at home, 50% somewhere, 50% in a football match or a cricket match. You're 100% there in your work. That means your entire energy system should be completely involved, you know, happily, in happy adherence, in happy adherence into the work that you are. Then there is no scope of that work not being doing good. There's no scope. When you're 100% involved in what you're doing, there's no scope that you won't do well. And in other people's eyes, if there is something that you're not still doing well, you're not accountable to it, you're not answerable to it because you're doing 100%. If you're doing 100%, A, there are no flaws. If you're doing 100%, if you're involved 100%, I don't mean that you're struggling to do 100%, a naturally 100% coming 
outward, you know, and people who look at you, they know that, oh, he doesn't think about anything while he's at work. He's 100% here, you know, and then appreciation, uh, evaluation, everything goes on quite normally and properly, you know. So 100% attention and 100% presence in the work will make your work very successful. So when you get back home from work, 100% presence in the home and not thinking about work. When you go back home, you're 100% present at home and not thinking about work. Don't carry your work home. Finish it where it needs to be finished. You need to carry work back home when you've not worked 100% at work uh, at your work desk. Then you need to carry work home. If you work 100% on your desk, there is no institution or organization which so unreasonably burdens you with overworking. Nobody does that. We don't do our work on time, then we need to carry work at home. Yeah, so it's very important not to carry work at home. When you're home, you're at home. You know, I knew a very old professor, a gone generation professor, who was a, a professor of English literature. And uh, he was a, a very old fashioned traditional Brahmin. Um, when he would go to the college, he would dress up with his tie and coat and suit and everything, and he would teach there and uh, would come home, change into his dhoti kurta and be at home. I was very small at that time when I used to see this person. And I was often wondering that it's like a play getting over, a drama getting over, and then another role at home. Two different uh, lives, two different lives there. He would speak chaste English. And at home, he would speak his chaste native language. You know, and there was no crisscross of these two roles, which was, uh, and he was a very happy person, very, very happy person. So involved in his children and so involved with his wife and all his, uh, his role and his dharma that he had undertaken at home was 100%. And the role and the dharma that he had in his office was 100%. There was no flaw in both these. And this went on for years until he retired. I have seen such a person balance. And then there is something, um, you know, further to it. It's not just the presence that you need 100%. To have a 100% presence in the role that you undertake, also, it requires a depth in your personality. There has to be a depth in your personality because your mind is wavering all the time. So there is a certain lifestyle and a certain uh, uh, lifestyle changes that you need to make, you know, in, 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 in your own life to be able to be that person who can be 100% there when he's there and 100% here when he's here. These lifestyle changes are worthy. You know, they're, they're noteworthy because uh, when you come in, in this kind of a, a lifestyle, there is no escape to your being 100% in whatever you want to take in your life. And there is happiness, joy, there is a constant connection, anchoring with the power within you, within your soul. And then there are no mistakes. And if there are mistakes, they're okay. They're okay. They're a part of your progress, you know, because you've been 100%. So if you commit mistakes, it doesn't matter. You just go on, go on, go on with life because you're 100%, you know, in integrity with yourself, 100% integrity with oneself. So why, what is this kind of a lifestyle? Um, my Guru Dev used to say, you know, that if one wants all round progress, spiritual, material, um, worldly, all round progress, there's certain, you know, pillars and certain parameters that you should uh, commit to. You should commit to certain parameters, certain, um, you know, practices. Four of these he insisted on. There are four of these practices he insisted on. And he, he says that these are four practices that everyone should take up to, to experience evolution, conscious evolution, and to experience growth. What you were 20 years back, you should be able to say, no, I'm, I'm miles, miles, miles ahead. 20, 20 years, I was so naive or I was so ignorant. 20 years from now, from then, I am really, I'm really grown. And there's some people I know who say that we were just the same. What you were 20 years back, you're just the same. 40 years, you're just the same. So there's been no progress, no conscious progress. Progress is not, you know, you don't, there's, there's no barometer of money for progress, mind you. The, the money is not the only bar barometer or the, or the scale. There are several, several other criteria which one uh, needs to tick mark to, to say that, yes, I've progressed. So Gurudev used to say there are four important things. One of them is he says, everyone must meditate. 
Now, everyone must meditate and meditation is not something we are taught in school, which is a very big mistake. I feel the education system must incorporate all these four things into the, into the education, uh, main education streamline. So he said, everyone must meditate. What is this meditation? All right, briefly, just five minutes, I will talk about. Meditation is conscious sleep and sleep is unconscious meditation. Meditation is conscious sleep. That means you're awake, but you're putting your body to so much of rest in those 20 minutes to half an hour that it's almost like you're sleeping. There's no movement, there's no energy movement. Uh, there's no energy movement anywhere in the body. You're just still. The stillness, experience of peace and stillness consciously as if you're sleeping for 20 minutes is important for all the alignment process in the body. Everything gets aligned. The brain gets aligned in that 20 minutes to half an hour. And there is a restful adherence to all the activities outside. Restful adherence to all the activities outside. So he said that meditation, everybody must, even if you don't know meditation, can you sit still with your eyes closed for half an hour? It's very important. Eventually, he says, Krishna says that it's difficult to meditate, but it's abhyas. You do it every day, every day, every day. Just sit still with your eyes closed and keep watching your breath and be, have a smile looking at yourself as if you're sitting in front of the mirror and you're smiling at yourself for 20 minutes, half an hour. Women, if you imagine that there's a mirror in front of me and I have to keep smiling more and more beautifully for half an hour, I think you will attain the state of meditation. Very easy. Yeah. So meditation is something which is un inescapable, unavoidable, and your self-reflection to understand that you're a lotus bud, to understand what kind of a flower you are, to understand what kind of person you are. This reflection for 20 minutes to half an hour is very, very important. Second, he said that some form of a spiritual religious practice like mantra japa or reading out a part every day, whatever tradition you may belong to, you may belong to the Sikh religion or the Christianity or the Muslim religion or the Hindu religion. We all have scriptures. All of the traditions in the world have scriptures and scriptures have been written by enlightened people, people who have attained highest realization and have come very close to God. Yeah. So scriptures are there in all our traditions, reading out something little from the scriptures every day or doing a mantra japa, they're doing one mala of a mantra every day. What does this do? What does this do? You see, even if, a, even if a, a log of wood is accidentally gone into the fire, it burns, right? The, the log cannot burn by itself, but if it, even if it goes accidentally into the fire, it gets burned. So nam smaran and reading noble, uh, you know, words from the scriptures are like fire that burn unnecessary stuff out of your mind. Your whole body, listen to this carefully, your whole body has three categories, you know, three different parts. The yoga talks about panchakosha, but I'm explaining more, more briefly, more clearly, more simpler. All right, you have three different levels of living. Your body has three levels, right? The first is the physical body, the gross body, what you see, the muscles, bones, organs, everything. Second is your subtle body. Your subtle body is your, you know, mind, intellect, memory, ego, all of these are very active. All of you agree and know that although you don't know the technical name, subtle body, but you know that you have a mind, you know you have a brain, uh, intellect is there, you know you have an ego, very sharp and spiked. And then we all have memory, we remember the past and some people even remember past lives, etc. So this fourfold equipment of man, buddhi, chitta, ahankar, you know, you call it the antakarna, we call it the antakarna, it's the inner equipment. This inner equipment is a massive body. It's a huge body to deal with. And actually all of you are struggling with this body. You know, few people have uh, aches and pains and you know, diseases or uh, gross body uh, variations are happening. But here's your subtle body here. This subtle body is, is a huge thing to manage. You know, the alignment and the friendliness of all these four together of the intellect, memory, ego, and the mind. All of these four together can eradicate stress completely. If these four are in alignment with your soul, stress can be, can be erased completely. In the worst of the situation, the most challenging situation, in the toughest of the situation, one can remain like an unwavering uh, 
drashta one can one can stand like a unwavering you know witnesser you you don't get shaken up for small little things there are no vagaries vagaries will not uh, affect you you remain like a witness so your system is available 100% to do what you need to do and you're not shaken up with all of this uh, disturbances in the world so your first body was the gross body or the physical body second body was the subtle body there is a third body that most of us are unaware of and this is called the causal body c a u s a l in hindi we say the physical body is stool sharir the subtle body is sukshma sharir and the causal body is called karan sharir it's called karan sharir now the causal body is something which is not visible it might it's microscopically even nano nano i i uh, i i don't know the english word for it that it's so 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 subtle subtlest of the subtle so it's not physically visible you can't see it with your eyes nor can you see it under your microscope so because and and this causal body is is you know very close in close proximity to the soul it it goes with the soul it travels with the soul life after life this this part of information what i'm sharing with you is a is a is a proved uh, information it's a validated information from the comes from the vedas and it it's taught in yogic psychology okay so the causal body travels with the soul and this causal body that's why it's called karan sharir because everything that you manifest you see manifested in your life whatever you see around you all right all of this is emanating is coming out from the causal body you have uh, the causal body is filled up with seeds of karma and uh, seeds of it's it's kind of a memory body it's kind of a memory body that has traveled with the soul for several lifetimes and it carries memories right from the animal kingdom you know to every human birth that you've taken uh, this causal body has been traveling and it's there now in your body in your body because this is your soul yeah when you die the soul will take the causal body and go into another you that would be born so this causal body has kind of imprints of all your thoughts and actions all your thoughts and actions from the beginning of your soul's journey to now and even now whatever you thinking whatever you doing gets imprinted in the causal body so the story that you're experiencing as your life story whatever story you're experiencing as your life story is emanating has been broadcasted from the causal body it's like a movie you know when you when you sit in the theater and you, when you watch a movie there is there are some actors there on the screen but they're not actually there on the screen they're coming from the projector light is throwing it on the screen and it's coming from the thin film which is behind which is in the projector right so similarly your causal body is like a film and your soul is the lamp is the is the light and it projects the scene entirely outside in the world whatever you're experiencing is coming from your causal body and it's your story so all the people who are there in your life are all coming from your causal body and that's why this scene is being played if i want to change something in the scene outside suppose i don't like this person that i'm dealing with i can leave him and go away i will see that wherever i go i find a similar kind of a person again there ready to give me the same experience you can go on changing people your experiences don't change they don't change as long as they are there in your causal body so if there is any real change you want to make in the world outside it has to be a change that you create in your own inside your causal body if if those black marks are removed from the causal body the black people outside are removed the darkness outside is removed so the more glorious and light filled your causal body becomes sublime pure beautiful your causal body becomes the more pure beautiful full of light and happiness and joy your outside world will become and this is something which is the secrets of the secret that is shared by our mentors and our masters and all the rishis from the olden times It says that the only freedom you have is to purify your inside when you purify the inside outside is purified automatically if you want to be successful in this world which is your birthright it's not required that all of you become like very um spiritual and very devotional and very no the world is a playground created by god and we are here to play and we are here to to celebrate his uh, creation we are here to to achieve and attain the apex and the zenith of our life whatever life you have you've been wanting whatever life your soul wants 
you to experience in this life. You have every right to attain and achieve that and manifest that. But it should be within the ethical norms, like uh, Mishraji said, it should be within the ethical norms, following all ideals and principles, refining your thought process day by day, making it more and more beautiful. So when you make your thought process more and more beautiful, your life outside there will become more and more beautiful. So the entire focus should be inside, not outside. Outside, you just delegate and keep performing, 100% performance. Don't bother, don't worry about who is doing, what is doing. Don't hear unnecessary news and don't hear all the gossip all the day. No, your focus should be inside. When your focus is inside, the automatically, automatically your outside life gets beautiful. Yeah, so Gurudev said, the first thing was meditation to be done every day. Second thing, do some form of scriptural reading. This will enhance your inside. It will not only enhance your inside, but it will create a better you day by day, day by day, day by day. Each day, as you grow, you will get a, you get a better perception of who you truly are, and you would have a better perception of what I'm supposed to do in the world. Yeah, so scriptural reading, and if possible, doing a mantra japa every day. The third thing he said was uh, swadhyay, you know, swadhyay. That means that uh, what you read, about uh, the truth of life, what you read about the truth of life, reading dharmic books, books on dharma, or reading core spiritual books enhances and takes you closer and closer to the truth and makes you more and more aware of what are the things that you need to fulfill as long as you're living. Because your living is there only from the time you take birth and the time you die. There isn't any living after that. There is another incarnation after that. So what you need to perform in the world has to be in this lifespan. And therefore, each day is very precious, is very valuable. You need to more and more understand about yourself. So Adhyay is Swaka Adhyay, understanding myself, understanding myself, evaluating, contemplating, reflecting, you know, introspecting, what is it that I want? What is it that I wish to do? What are the things that I want? Write down the list of things that you want. It could be even worldly things, like you want, you want to be rich, you want to be famous, you want to be well-known, you want to be talented and gifted, you want to be appreciated, you want to be loved, you want a perfect relationship. Write down these things and then keep reflecting on this. Why do I want these things? Why do I want these things? I want more money. I want to be rich because everybody is thinking being rich is going to make you happy. You want to be rich. You want to be rich because you want your children to have a better life. You want your wife to have a better life. So, you know, keep reflecting on these points and so that you don't get distracted with what others want. The moment somebody talks to you about what he wants, you start imagining, okay, I think even I should be wanting this. I think even I should join a dance class. Somebody is joining a dance club, you know, I should join a dance club. Somebody is singing so well, oh, I wish I could sing. You know, somebody, so it's like, you know, your brain and your mind is getting contaminated all the time with your extra outside information, which is not required. You need information about yourself. You need information about yourself. Sit down and reflect, Swadhyay. Read something very scriptural, valuable, Noble, written by noble people. Don't, you know, you, the new age books are not Swadhyay. I mean, you're reading the monk who sold the Ferrari and you, that's just not Swadhyay. Swadhyay is when you read scriptural, you know, things that are, inputs that are coming from noble people. Yeah, read something and then keep reflecting. Write down your desires. Surrender these desires to the divine. There is a very beautiful system that we have in our tradition called Upasana. You know, Upasana is a very beautiful system. It says that up asana, that means I sit down uh, and I let God take the lead. So in the evening, after you've done your work and you go home, you take a shower, take on the practice of upasana. Make a beautiful small altar that represents the divine. Here there is no concept of, you know, you, you, you must have a Shiva statue or a Lakshmi statue or a or a picture of the Christ. There's, there's no such system I'm encouraging. I'm encouraging you to appreciate the, the creator of this universe. And I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging you to appreciate the presence of this power in the universe that guides and, and kind of creates situations that it's fathomless. It's fathomless, absolutely mind blowing when you think how automated every system is happening, how seasons are coming, how our planet is floating into the solar system. You know, why doesn't it fall down? and how every, every planet is orbiting at a set time. 
and how the sun is managing this whole system. And beyond this galaxy, there are so many galaxies and the universe is fathomless. Who's managing all this universe? So that power, you know, can you, can you bring it, crystallize that power and bring it on your altar? Can you, can you put a representative of that power in the altar in the form of a picture or an idol or, or something or a stone? Just let it be there. Okay, this is the representative of this huge power that, uh, you know, I'm living on the earth and this power is taking care of this whole thing. Sit down, take a up asana to this power and uh, reflect on all the things that went on in the office today and what all happened and you had an argument with someone, someone hit at you and, you know, uh, was taunting at you, was sarcastic and the pain you experienced at that time, you couldn't say anything because that was your boss and uh, all that the students said to you and reflect on all these things and reflect how was your behavior all through the day, you know? And can you learn the art of just taking it all in your hand and offering it to the divine in the evening? Can you just learn the art of unloading yourself in front of the divine each day? Light a lamp, sit down and do some breath work, just sit quietly, silently, cry if you want to cry, Unload yourself completely and offer it to the divine because it is in his supervision. It's in my supervision, my personal supervision. Everything is happening. The day and night, the seasons, everything is happening. This power, you need to bring this power in your life. You need to bring the, the, the presence of this power and the constant reminder of this power in your life. Without an anchor, you feel insecure. Without an anchor, you feel full of fear. You feel worried, you feel stressed. The moment you have an anchor and a divine anchor that can manage the solar system, suppose he takes you personally under his supervision, wouldn't that be wonderful? Suppose the, the power that's managing this entire solar system and this universe, suppose this power promises to take you under his personal mentorship, wouldn't that be wonderful? He will take you under his personal mentorship if you create a seeking. If you create a seeking, if you sit under in the, in the upasana and say that, boss, can you take me as your, as, a, as, as your child or as your student? He will take it. He will take it. And this anchoring into the divine is one of the best medicines to stress. Best medicines. You hand over your life, you know, what, what, what he demands from you, he demands from you 100% integrity. He demands from you, are you working 100%? Do you, are, you, are you working towards knowing yourself? Are you meditating every day? Are you reading something good every day? This is what he's demanding, all right? And, and the moment you do this, he takes you under his wings. And there is, there's no stress after that. So Gurudev says, first thing, meditation. Second thing, some form of a japa or some form of a purifying of the mind, you know, it could be a part, it could be uh, some form of a, a, a stotras that you read every day, or maybe a Gayatri mantra that you do every day, okay? Third is Swadhyay, constantly reading noble writings. And fourth is Seva. Gurudev says fourth is Seva. So Seva is, is not like, you don't have to be, you don't have to have a big NGO to do a Seva, all right? Seva is having an, an attitude of, Vigilance, you know, I have constant vigilance that does somebody need me here? You know, you just, you're just walking and you pick up somebody's hanky or pen and give. You're doing something, well, let me do it for you. You know, that is one approach of seva, that you're constantly available, you know, to do things for others that you can within your parameters, of course. And then there is also a committed seva. That means in your day-to-day -day life, in your everyday life, you must commit to some aspect of serving nature some aspect of serving nature. It could be a small commitment like, say, feeding sugar granules to ants every day, or could be watering that one tree in your garden or that one tree in your locality, or maybe feeding stray dogs, or maybe, you know, going helping once in a week in an old age home, or committing, but this is with commitment, no? And so every day night, when you sit down for your upasana in the evening, you should be able to stick mark Today did I meditate? Today did I do my chapa? Today have I read something good? Today have I done my seva? If these four things you do every day, there is no stress in life. I can ensure you. 
And this is part that, I mean, things will happen. Stories don't dissolve. You know, your story will not dissolve. You've accumulated it over several lifetimes. You're carrying it in your causal body. You can't do away with it. Your mentor, your God is not going to take away this story. He will make you go through all that, but he will ensure that he is holding your hand and not leaving it any time. He will ensure that out of this difficult situation, you come out victorious and glorious and better than before. He will ensure that you're rewarded after every time you get penalized. Each time you get penalized, you will be rewarded. He makes sure that this will happen. And then life journey is, is beautiful. So this balance, what we're talking about in, in, you know, in our discussion today, uh, life, work, and stress. What is this? How do you balance life and work? And how do you make your life stress-free? This way of life is important. You have to make lifestyle changes. You must make lifestyle changes. Spread your, spend your, spread and spend your, you know, the whole days, hours very intelligently. And make sure that you take, make room and take space for all these four things that I've just narrated. And a consistent inquiry in who am I? Which flower am I? Am I a rose or a lotus? What is the truth of my being? There is something spectacular in each one of you. If you can find out what is spectacular about you, you've won it. You've done it in your life. You need to just find out what is this most spectacular thing in me. And also a very generic understanding that each one doesn't have to be Sachin Tendulkar. Each one doesn't have to be Amitabh Bachchan. Each one doesn't have to be uh, uh, Shri Modi. We all have roles to play on this earth. And if you understand what is spectacular about you, you'll play that role. Many years back, I had a gardener in, in, uh, in our house, you know, uh, a, a very poor man, old poor man. So he, I would see him working the whole day without any distraction. And I, I never saw him gossiping or talking to anyone. He would have his attention on the plants, keep doing his gurai and, you know, on his work. Afternoon, he would eat little rice with, with pickle that his wife would give. Many times I've checked his stiffen box. I saw that the rice used to be burnt. It used to be burnt. And I used to offer him, you take some vegetable, take your rice, uh, eat your rice properly. He said, no, Maji, this is, my, this is my due. I love this. I love what she's cooked for me. And he would be happy eating that rice and pickle every day. And I saw him working for years together with so much of dedication, so much of happiness and joy on his face. The only thing he would do is have a BD outside after his lunch. Other than that, I haven't seen the man speak anything at all or say anything at all. So it's nothing less than a saint. This man was nothing less than a saint. So a life fulfilled is that life which adheres to all the things in complete acceptance, whatever is there, and making the best out of what work you're doing. He was such a good gardener, such a good, indispensable. I could never think of having anybody else other than him to do with, with the plants. So, so meticulously, so much of love and attention. So it's important that you've done the best that you could do in your life. You've attained, you've achieved the zenith of your if your life. It's not necessary to be famous always. It's not necessary to be stinkingly rich always. No. The, the best life is that life which is in each moment in joy and it's, it's in joy, in happiness and it's constantly connected to the divine. Because the more and more you anchor into the divine, the divine shows you the beauty in your life. He shows you the beauty in your life. That's the best mentor. He will show you what's so spectacular in you. The appreciativeness that you have about yourself automatically attracts like, you know, it's like aap itne mithe ho jate ho, itne mithe ho jate ho, that so many people get attracted to you. And that's, that's the attainment, that's the achievement in life, to be such a beautiful human being. Yeah. So I think there are a lot of questions there. Shalini, I would just like to. Hmm. How can a person who is good and godly but doesn't believe in the existence of God be spiritual in his behavior and career? If a person is good and godly, he will believe in God. The problem is that we most of us don't know what is God. You know, the, the entire institution of religiosity has been very contaminated over several years in all the traditions, be it the church, be it the mosque, or be it the 
temple tradition. There's been a lot of contamination. And so many people are fearful of the word God. You know, so the best thing is to define who is your God. You define your God. You don't take the God that is given to you by people. Don't do, don't do that. You define your word God. For, for, for instance, I, for me, the power that controls this universe, it's a beautiful power. Sometimes, you know, you, you just make something. Uh, we need an icon naturally, you know, because our brain system is built up in such a way that unless we see something, what we are talking about, we don't believe in it. So because God is not visible, you know, that's why we don't believe in it. The moment I make a representative of it, anything, any icon that I make, okay, this is my God. And it represents that universe and the power and all of that, which is fathomless. Then I have start having my communications with God. So if you say you're God and godly, then you believe in God, but you don't believe in the God that people believe in. And that's completely all right. Yeah. Yes. Um, would request the contact details of institution. Yes, surely I will, we'll share it with Charlene, we'll share it with you. How can we justify the discourses on God in our academic curriculum consisting of diverse subjects? So it can be taught as a science, more, more, more like science than a scriptural education. Science where, for instance, this yogic psychology is such an in-depth psychology. It's so, it's so, so, so understandable. It's, it's logical. The moment you read it all, you know, it's, it's logic. It's pure science. So everything spiritual can be taught in a scientific way, you know, but it needs to be incorporated at a school level education and college level education, because when they're adults, they're already conditioned. And then to incorporate something, a third dimension into your existing overcrowded dimensions is a difficult thing. You know, it's a very difficult thing. Things like meditation and, uh, you know, self-healing, self-care. For instance, when you talk about stress, can you imagine that it's so simple to unload yourself of that stress? There's free flowing energy. There's cosmic energy constantly flowing through your body. We are, we are channels, we are like pipes, you know, there's energy entering through our crown and excess energy is all the time going through our feet. This has been validated by science already. We have machines in America, a lot of research is going on on healing. Yeah, we have machines now that can, that can measure the energy that a person is channeling, okay? So that's not something that I would like to prove right here. So we have energy that's constantly moving from our head and down bottom into the, from out from the feet. And this energy, as it goes from our body, it gets, gets absorbed. We call it life force energy. It gets absorbed in all by all the organ systems and all your physiological functions. Everything is happening nurtured with this life force energy. So this moving energy, life force energy, can get channeled wherever you want it to channel. The yogic psychology says that Pranamaya kosha and manonmaya kosha are together. That means the mind and the prana, your mind and the energy inside you go hand in hand. That means wherever you put your mind, the energy goes there. Taking a very simple example, if you're reading a book, if, you're, if the, book, the book is open and you're reading it and for some time you start thinking, daydreaming about someone and you're reading the book and you slap yourself and you say, come on, put your mind here and read it. If you don't put your mind into the book, you don't assimilate, you don't absorb what you're, what you're reading, yeah? So wherever the mind is, the energy goes there. If I'm thinking about someone, my energy goes there. If I look at something constantly, my energy goes there pinpointedly like a laser beam, yeah? So the mind and the prana are connected. Now, when you sleep at night, a very simple exercise I would like to share with you. When you sleep at night, when you lie down on the bed at night, if you just put your hands on your heart and let's say the second hand on your stomach, you know, your stomach area, we call it the Manipura area, is the, is the area where maximum stress accumulates because this is the, the solar plexus or the Manipura, this is the chakra or the energy vortice that uh, contributes to all the work that you do outside, you know. It contributes to all the worldly parameters. And one heart, hand on your heart because your heart experiences emotions. If somebody is sarcastic in the office with you, your heart experiences pain. So these two chakras, predominantly get upset when you are in an upsetting work environment, okay? So when you're lying down at night, put your one hand here, the other hand on the stomach, and just close your eyes and do deep focus breathing for about three, four minutes, five minutes. Put on a beautiful musical track 
and do deep focus breathing. Smile, put a smile on your face and do deep focus breathing with your hands. One hand on the heart, the other hand on your stomach. Even this exercise done for five minutes every day can distress you completely. Forget about many other processes that we normally teach. This simple process of keeping one hand on your heart with love, with a smile, putting on a good, beautiful music track and just deep breathe, relax with every breath, take a deep breath inside and relax. Do it for five minutes, it will completely distress you, right? As simple as that, right? Okay. What would you say? Yes, Shalini, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say about the experience of feeling the presence of someone other within yourself and seeing the self looking at you from a distance? Yes, Garima, that is a very beautiful question. We Sometimes, you know, there is a me in me that watches the me all the time. Yeah, we call it witnessing consciousness. For evolved people, people who are highly qualified and refined as human beings, there's a witness consciousness born inside you. That means there'll be a watcher, there'll be a witnesser inside you that witnesses all that you go through. So even if I'm crying, there's a me in me that watches the me all the time. This one is smiling always. You know, the witnesser in me is always, we call it witnessing consciousness. And this is a, you have experienced it probably. And so you are asking, what is this in me? Who is this in me? We call it the witnessing consciousness, the drashta, the drashta in you. And this drashta, when it is awakened or it is born, it's, it's a permanent, uh, uh, you know, thing. It will watch you doing everything. That means as, as I'm doing something, like I'm talking at this moment to you, there is this witness in me, which is watching what I'm talking. It's listening to what I'm talking. So there's a part of me which is listening to what I'm saying. Yeah. And it's a very beautiful achievement. It's a very beautiful attainment. Yeah. Uh, my life forces us to shift between being materialistic and unmaterialistic. I feel it is very difficult and it makes me feel that I'm unreal. How to handle this? Yes. At the core, uh, uh, Dr. Praveen, at the core, when you've not understood who you truly are, then this dissatisfaction and this uh, disconnection happens between what you truly are and what you are truly outside there, what you're outside there. It's a disconnected feeling. You're not in alignment. So it's very important for you to turn inward and do a self-inquiry. Who am I? What are the things that I really love to do? I mean, if you're at, at the age of, let's say, 50, what you really love to do at the age of 20 should be, you know, introspected. What you love to do when you were a child, what you love to do when you're in the middle age somewhere, a reflection on your core likings uh, has to be introspected on. And what have you groomed yourself into now today at, 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 a, at a senior age when you groomed yourself to be so-and-so? Probably this, what you groomed yourself into is not in complete acceptance and alignment but the, by the one that you were waiting to be. The soul, you know, is born, every life is taken, but the soul has certain desires, certain packages, you know, it wants to achieve some things. It's expecting you to do that, you know, and many times we don't hear it because of the conditioning. Our parents teach us, you have to be successful. Uh, the society has certain barometers of, um, uh, parameters of success and so on. So our conditioning, uh, in our conditioning, we've forgotten what truly we wanted to be when the soul want, has taken birth, when the soul has brought us into this body. Yeah, so it's very important to introspect and to reflect. Yeah. All right, lovely. This is a very nice, and there's so many questions here gone, but I haven't seen them. How can a person who is good and godly, okay, I've answered this. Many a times individual goals are sacrificed due to institutional. This was, I think, of the previous session. Okay, if something else you want me to speak about, Shalini, uh, let this be an interactive session. If there is a question kindly asked, I would love to clarify. I think <laughs> so. There are so many questions, ma'am, but you have clarifying or clarified all doubts. Yeah. So so if more questions will be there, they need to know the place as well. So I'll definitely forward uh, the yeah, details. I, I live in Rishikesh. I am uh, one of Shalini's mentors also. And yes. uh, a lot of people from her institution know me and uh, have visited our premises. I live outskirts of Rishikesh, about 20 kilometers in a small hermitage called Kirti Hermitage. 
And uh, uh, in fact, she's introduced. It's a beautiful by, place. <laughs> yes, she's introduced me. I I love to speak on energy. Energy is my core pursuit. I uh, impart all Vedantic teachings and uh, uh, teach a lot of healing modalities, different healing modalities from different cultures of the world. And uh, uh, I'm leading uh, the life of a hermit. So that's why the, there's a hermitage. So I think I'll, I'll sum up the talk and then I can take leave. The, the summing up is this, that to create a balance between work and life, you have to understand life first. You have to understand life. What is life about? What were you born for? Understand yourself. And there are teachers today, a lot of teachers today who will make you understand who you truly are and what you truly should be doing. So you understand life and the core values of life. Set up an ideals and a principles kind of a living. You know, your life must be on principles and ideals. There, there should be some ethical parameters you should follow. Doing that, you don't get confused between what is right and what is wrong. When you follow certain ethical norms, then there isn't anything right and wrong to think about. This is either right or this is wrong. Finish. And that makes your life very easy. It's, it's only in some very challenging situations that you've taken on roles that are very challenging and then your, your playing that role does not fit into the right and it doesn't fit into the wrong and then it's a very difficult, challenging thing. But you have to make a call, take a call someday to jump this side or that side, never to hang in between. You must take a call and listen to your heart and take decisions this way or that way. Don't, don't hang in the middle. Ling, uh, lingering in the middle you know, will not uh, take you to the zenith of your existence. It would be fulfilling time um, uh, and, and probably earning and probably providing bread and butter, but more than that, nothing will be achieved, yeah? So you must, you must go this way or that way to, to fulfill the, the truth of your being, yeah? So understanding life first and then committing to a work role that is very easily fulfillable by you because if it's in line with your true nature, it's not an effort for fire to be fire, but it's a big effort for water to become fire. Yeah. And so when you're doing something, when you take up a role and, and commit to a work uh, scenario, which is in line with your nature, I love to teach. So I can teach day and night, 24 by seven. It doesn't exhaust me because it's natural. But if I was not loving how to teach, then teaching could have been very strenuous for me. Yeah. So you take up a role that is in line with your true nature. And when you take that, you effortlessly delegate. You effortlessly live your role. It's not strenuous then. I know for someone who loves to cook can stand for hours and hours and cook. But for someone who doesn't love to cook, it's too much of a headache to cook even for an hour. Yeah? So you, you must choose your work role according to your true nature and that which fits into your life core purpose. Your life core purpose. Yeah? So when, that, when these two become one, then work and life are not separate. They're one. Your work and life is not separate. They're one. You're living life when you're working. And as you're in your, in your life, you're still working. It's, the work is not separate from your life. It should be like your breath. It should be like your breath. It's not an effort to breathe. It's natural. Yeah. So take up roles that are very, that are, that are in close proximity with your true nature. Then life and work will be harmoniously happening. And then there is no stress. Stress comes when they are not in harmony. When your life and work are not in harmony, they are not hand in hand, they are quite contradicting to each other, then there is stress. Stress is not there otherwise. And the other areas of stress that come from uh, office politics and from competition and from backbiting and this and that, these are things that you can comfortably avoid if you live within your ethical norms and be 100% in integrity with your work. You can avoid them and you never be scared of them. Never be scared of them. If you are 100% in alignment with your ethics and are in integrity and you're pre performing 100% to your best, you know, then there is nothing you should be worried about. You should never be worried about. Somebody kicks you out, it doesn't matter. Many doors open for you. you know? So there is a mentor that is watching you. That's why I insist on bringing this mentorship of God in your life. If there's a mentor watching you. You know you've been 100%. You're not lying to him. You, never, you can never lie to him. Yeah? The human body, always remember, the human body is a self-monitored, independent, flawless machine. The human body is a self-monitored, independent, flawless machine where there are no mistakes. Everything automatically is emerging and coming out from the causal body 
and the soul or the God is personally monitoring everything moment to moment. They, there are no mistakes here. So nothing happening in your life is wrong or is not yours or you have not created it. You don't take honest with it. Everything happening in your life is coming out from within you. And if it is coming from within you, you have to take responsibility for it. Even the mess that is there outside is emanating from you. You have to take the responsibility and come into truth and alignment and slowly sort it out. It will slowly get sorted out when you get sorted out inside. Yeah. So with that, I will take leave. And uh, Shalini, is, is, there, is there something more you want me to talk about? Otherwise, I'll take leave. <laughs> Ma, thank you so much, Ma. Your words are such a motivation to all of us. We are totally refreshed and learned a lot. Thank you so if much. we implement definitely such given techniques in our life, we will be able to lead our life successfully. And through unfolding our potential and practicing in a true sense. So definitely we can lead our life successfully with alignment. Uh, definitely, as you said, alignment is absolutely necessary. Yes. So determination mm -hmm. is the key and practicing is a right with right perspective makes us perfect so thank you so much for your beautiful explanation of loving living blissfully and simple way of living Thanks. so i request each participant be regular to all sessions pick up the pearls of wisdom and thank you everyone and over to you dr puja <laughs> thank you so much thank you, thank you dr puja Thank you, ma'am, and uh, I'm grateful to you, and we seek your blessings always, because yes. you know, this is a very uh, insightful session for us, and your each and every word, your energy is, you know, is reaching up to us. Thank you so much. Yeah. All the best to you, and lots of blessings to everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Ma. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Shalini, for beautifully moderating this session. Uh, and with this, we are uh, will leave for first session. We are done with the first session, and we'll meet at exactly at 1:40 1 uh, 1 p.m. Because uh, today we have a very special uh, guest speaker again for for our uh, FTP, for the second day of FTP, Mr. Andrew Gibbons from University of Oxford, and he will be talking about leadership skills. So uh, I request all the participants to kindly share your questions in the chat box right now regarding uh, the leadership skills, how, uh, how important the leadership skills are. You must have seen in the brochure and I've shared the brief about Mr. Andrew Gibbons in the group as well. So kindly go through this, go through the uh, bio brief of Mr. Andrew Gibbons because he will be joining us from University of Oxford and he really requires, you know, kind of interactive session from all of you. So, uh, uh, I request all of all the participants to kindly put up the questions beforehand. If if, uh, if we can log in by 1.30 or 1.35 p.m. today, uh, this afternoon, then we can plan and we can talk to him regarding, you know, what are his expectations, what are your expectations, because he really wants to have hands-on experience and hands-on workshop with all of us. So it's my humble request to everyone to kindly log in by 1.35 or 1.40 maximum for this session with Mr. Andrew Gibbons from Oxford University. So looking forward to your uh, more interactive and more active participation in the upcoming uh, session for afternoon. With this, thank you so much to everyone for your time, for your energy to this session. Thanks a lot. And for your attendance, we are getting a lot of queries for attendance. Please. Uh, Note that your attendance is counted throughout the session. Your, your, the time you are spending here, the duration, the total amount, the total duration you are, uh, you know, logging in for the for every session that will be taken into consideration. Uh, in spite of you know some internet connectivity you all are facing, so that we can uh, get away with. But your maximum time you are spending in every session that will be taken into consideration for compiling the attendance uh, for all the ten sessions that we have covered. So with this, thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Shalini, for uh, for co-organizing this event today. And uh, thanks. I think we can uh, prepare for the upcoming session with this. Thank you.